Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to worship. We are so glad that you're here. So, like everyone else in America, uh, this week I watched uh, the, the election returns to see if one of the two major party candidates would be declared to be president. And it didn't happen on Tuesday. It didn't happen on Wednesday. It didn't happen on Thursday. But uh, on Thursday, one of my Presbyterian pastor friends posted the following meme. It showed a picture of John Calvin, the Protestant reformer who essentially founded Presbyterianism, along with his caption, every day is election day when you're a Calvinist. <laughs> this is because Calvinist Presbyterians strongly believe that God graciously elects or chooses to save us, even though we don't deserve it. It is called the doctrine of election. And so when election day seemed to drag on and on, it seemed like politics was mirroring good theology in a weird way. So the next time someone tells you, oh, I'm so glad the election is over, you can respond by saying, well, you know, theologically, every day is election day. And just look at what they, what the look on their, their face. You know, who knows, it might be a good opportunity to teach them some good Christian theology. So anyway, that's your theological nerd humor of the day. <laughs> In any case, welcome to worship. We're glad you're here. Welcome. We do welcome you this morning. We are so blessed to have you here, and you're blessed by your presence, whether you're in our church sanctuary or online. Please know that you are important to us, and we welcome you. Uh, for those of you with a bulletin in your hands, I would encourage you to look over the announcements on the announcement page. We have a couple of important announcements I want to highlight verbally, so here we go. First one. The property, man, property ministry team wants you to know that we are continuing our search for a new color for the background area behind the cross. We have taken your input to pursue colors less brown, less dark, and our sample color proposal is in the center. Okay, if you can see that. And the left portion of the lower cross background area. We look forward to receiving your input on this color. Um, okay, and then second, uh, due primarily to our computer problems right now, we do not have a November newsletter yet, but we do hope to get one out this week as our Secretary Jan will be returning from her vacation. Third, next Sunday, we'll have a special congregational meeting to approve Pastor Jim's compensation package for 2020, excuse me. We had planned to hold this meeting months ago, but then the pandemic occurred. Um, at its most recent meeting, the session called for this rescheduled meeting to be held this coming Sunday, November 15th, immediately following worship. So we're going to try to make provisions for people to participate via Zoom if they are unable to attend in person. Fourth, we are changing the order of worship this morning slightly for this particular Sunday morning as we are incorporating a special response, prayer of thanksgiving, as well as a, uh, a renewal of baptismal promises. Therefore, the moment for reflection is moved to just after the sermon. We appreciate your flexibility and hope that these temporary changes freshen up the worship this morning and make it more meaningful for you. Um, Patty, did you have an announcement? You may. Um, oh, okay, go ahead. Patty Rush is part of our mission, uh, missions okay. ministry. Um, yes, we were um, talking about missions and we're having kind of a hard time this year trying to do our missions. Um, and our wise clerk suggested that we just do things locally instead of the Christmas uh, uh, boxes. And so I called. Um, Great House, and that's the home for um, battered women and children, and you know, they've been in abusive situations in their safe Grace House. And they gave me um, a family, they gave us a family, and it's a family of a mother and three children. And the boy, Eugene, is autistic, and he's eight years old, and then there's two twin girls, um, Bella and 
Alaya, and they are um, several five years old. And their mom's name is Carol. And um, so because Eugene is autistic, it's all about comfort and food. And I'm sure, not sure what the, the actual U is called, but he likes a crazy wire thing that you could push the beads back and forth. Alaya is really getting into baby dolls and pretty girl things, and Bella is into ponies and dolls and anything that makes her focused. So we're going to put the tree up out here, and we're going to, they're going to be giving us more ideas, and we're going to put the tags out on the foyer, and then you just can go and pick up the tag and take it home and buy them a present and bring it back to church so they'll have a good Christmas. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Patty. That sounds wonderful. Uh, Ann, do you have an uh, announcement on behalf of the uh, property management? Well, we all know that uh, the property committee has been very busy, but especially one member of it, uh, Ron Lodge, who has really helped us manage the entire remodel project and we're most appreciative. But Ron has now been in the hole this week, and there are pictures on the uh, bulletin board because we finally have gotten the electrical service about, underground electrical service about ready, and Ron was an integral part of that, as well as our electrician, Guru, Scott Cruz, and uh, Douglas County PUD, of course. And the hole will be filled in, I believe, tomorrow morning, is it, Ron? Right. So, Thank you, Ron, and if you want to see pictures, they're posted on the board. <laughs> Thank you, Ann and Ron. Are there any other additional announcements from the, from this big crowd we have this morning? It's wonderful to see all you have here. No other announcements? Okay. Well, then we'll go on, please. Now, let's stand in body or spirit as together we sing our hymn of praise, Ye Servants of God. Hallelujah. 
and on and on. You may be seated. Now I would direct your attention to either the announcement page or the screen as we offer up the Lord. Oh, yeah, sorry. As we offer up the Lord, the responsive prayer of thanksgiving. I will read the plain text and you may respond with the text in bold. And let us pray. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, we give you thanks for your mighty deeds for us and our salvation, and we thank you for all the reminders as we experience in life of your goodness and your grace. For all the times we laughed until our sides ached, for all the times we were troubled and friends we didn't know had sprang up from nowhere and ministered to us, for all the times we could have chosen evil over good but didn't, for all the times we could have been hurt but weren't, for all the times we could have died suddenly and unprepared, but didn't. Oh, oh Lord, we thank you. For the sheer wonder of our creation, preservation, and redemption. For the privilege of prayer, the gift of the Spirit, and the gifts of the Spirit. For the everlasting arms beneath us, the watchful eye above us, and the friends around us, and the trust within us. Oh Lord, we thank you. For seed time and harvest and food enough, for every good night's sleep and every good day's work, for every good friend and every grand sunset, for warm memories of the past and the promise of an eternal tomorrow, for eyes to see beauty, ears to hear a bird's song, hands to hold someone else's hands, someone else's hands to hold. Oh Lord, we thank you. For all the, the persons whose love for us is unconditional and in whose presence we can drop all pretense, be ourselves, and know that we shall be accepted. For the one who calls us long distance and the one who calls us darling. For the ones who call us dad or mom. For the one who shall one day call us into eternity. O oh Lord, we thank you. For all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people, for our creation, our preservation, and for all the blessings of this life, for your great faithfulness to us in ages past. O oh Lord, we thank you. But most of all, O oh God, we thank you for your unfathomable, unmerited, and entirely undeserved love for us. May it know in the redemption of your world, in Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. We'll now sing our songs of praise, We Fall Down, and the Family Prayer Song.
Friends, hear now our call to confession. From the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4. Remember that our Lord Jesus can sympathize with us in our weakness, since in every respect he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, you are the one who knows the hairs on our heads, who whispers our names, who knows the deep wounds we live with in our hearts. Forgive us for our sins. We come to you in our brokenness, in our aching, in our sign, because you are the great physician. Heal us, O oh God. Heal our bodies and spirits. Heal our families, neighbors, and communities. Heal our cities, our nation, our world. Heal us, O oh God, by restoring our hope, our faith in one another. Heal us by helping us to be whole again, to let the practices that cause harm and cling to ways of justice mercy and peace. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear these words of blessing and assurance from Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing that will ever separate us from God's love. You are God's beloved child. You are forgiven, loved, and restored. Go and share the good news. Hallelujah and amen. Please stand and by your spirit as together we sing, Who is on the Lord's side? Thank you.
Let us take a moment to pray. Draw us close, Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away. May there be only one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Joshua, the 24th chapter, selected verses. Listen for God's word to you as I read. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel at Sh to Shechem, and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods, the, an the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, I will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Then he said, Put away the foreign gods that are among you, and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, I want to go through this passage uh, to unpack its meaning and to talk about how it applies uh, to our lives. So I kind of want to go through it verse by verse. So we begin with verse 1. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and some of the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. I believe that the most important word in all of verse 1 is the word all. Because Joshua issues this challenge to all of the tribes of Israel. Not just 11 out of the 12, but every single one. Not one of them is left out. And as we apply this to our situation, we realize that God is going to issue this challenge to each one of us and to all of us. No one is going to escape this challenge and this choice. All are included. Verse 2. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived in the Euphrates and served other gods. Here, Joshua is reminding the people about the history of, of their people. 
There was a time when they did not know God and when they served other gods. That is, gods plural and with a small g. Because they were not truly gods. They were certainly not the God of creation and the God of the universe. And as we apply that to our lives, we may be able to remember a time when we were not serving the Lord, when we did not serve the Lord. A time when we served other gods or, or idols or, or worshipped other things in the place where only God should occupy in our hearts. May we remember a time when we did not know the Lord or serve Him. And then we move on to verse 3a. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. Here, here God is reminding the people of the, the way in which he took Abraham, a uh, wandering Aramean, and gave him a land, a promised land, and gave him offspring, beginning with his son Isaac. If verse 2 was, you did not know or serve God, verse 3 is, God brought your ancestor Abraham out of a land and, into, and gave him a promised land and gave him offspring. In other words, verse 3 is about a time when the Lord prompts us to remember all that he has done for us in the past and for those who came before us in the faith. And indeed, we should remember all those things. And then from here, we skip down to verse 14. Now therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods that your ancestors served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Here in these verses, we get to the heart of the matter. The earlier verses reminded us of history, how once upon a time God's people did not know him or serve him, but served other gods in other places. And then God spoke to Abraham and gave him offspring and brought him into the land of Canaan. But now, verse 14 is about the, the present for Joshua and the people. Will they serve God or will they not serve God? This tells us that in every generation, and with every generation, there is a time for reckoning. It is a time to make certain faithful choices. A time to choose to serve God or not to serve God. Now in verse 16, the, the people make their choice, and, and here it is. Then the people answer, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Here in verse 16 through 18, the people strongly affirm that they will serve the Lord. And then they look back over the history of their people and, and see all the ways in which God has been faithful to them. And, and if they did not choose to serve the Lord, they would be forsaking the path that their people have walked for generations. They would be abandoning their heritage and the legacy of their faith. And they are not about to make such a faithful and drastic choice. However, it is not enough for Joshua to hear the people's affirmation once. He wants to hear it again. Plus, he wants them to realize, and maybe this is a key point, that in saying yes to God, they must say no to anything that competes with God. So verse 19. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. Here, it, is, it almost seems as though Joshua is not expressing much confidence in his people. 
and that he's leading. He seems to be saying, you think you're going to serve God? You cannot serve him. But then he goes on to say what serving God actually means. This means not serving or paying attention to everything that would compete with God. And Joshua warns the people that this, and this may be surprising to our ears, that God will not forgive the people if they say they will serve God and then go and serve other gods. And he says that if they do that, God is going to turn on the people. The people will be consumed by the wrath of God. In other words, if they serve other gods as the Egyptians served other gods, God is going to do to them what he did to the Egyptians. He's, he totally destroyed them. And this reminds me of uh, one of the favorite youth group songs that we used to sing, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, which is all about the Exodus, the story of the Exodus. It is sung to the, the tune Louie Louie, um, uh, and it's told uh, from Moses' perspective. And verse 2 is, of that song talks about um, delivering the Israelites, and there's actions to go along with it. Well, all of God's people come to the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army coming after me. I raised my rod, stuck it in the sand, and all of God's people walked across dry land. But verse 3 talks about what happened to the Egyptians. Well, all of Pharaoh's army was a coming to. So what do you think that I did do? I raised my rod and I cleared my throat. <coughs> you always have to cough. And all of Pharaoh's army did the dead man's float. <laughs> and a youth group, uh, depending on where we were, people would actually get on the ground and, and you know raise their arms and legs up in the air like dead bucks, you know? Um, it's kind of gallows humor, making light of the serious subject of God's punishment. But I will tell you one thing. I don't think anyone who ever sang that fun song forgot about what happened to the Egyptians. Not by a long shot. And that's why here, Joshua's making sure that the people of God, his people, they understand this choice that they are making. It is a choice with eternal consequences. You know, every four years, we choose a president here in our nation. And our nation, for better or worse, has to live with the consequences of that choice for four years, barring impeachment or resignation or, or death of a president. But here, Joshua is letting the people know that this is uh, not a choice that they can do over if they get it wrong. Now, while we do talk about the amazing and wonderful forgiveness of God, we talk about that especially in Jesus Christ. But the choice to ultimately turn one's back on God, well, that may be what the Bible talks about as the one unforgivable sin. And that is because God cares so much about his people. There's one modern creed which talks about how for some, God's love is expressed as wrath. Now we sometimes think that if you really love someone, you are never going to get mad at them. Well, that's wrong. Try being a parent and raising a functional human being without some sort of discipline. You simply cannot do it. Our culture would have you believe that discipline is evidence of a lack of love. It is not. The greatest evidence of a lack of love is not a lack of anger. It is a lack of caring. It is apathy. Apathy is the greatest sign that we do not love. And by that measure, the record turnout that we experienced in this national election is a positive sign of how much and how many people care deeply about our country. And so regardless of the results, I celebrate that fact and that good news. God loves his people so much that he will not tolerate them loving other gods as they love him. He will simply not allow it. Verse 21. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Here, Joshua is emphasizing to the people that their choice to serve God, it is a public 
choice. He, as their leader, and they collectively, are witnesses to the fact that they have chosen to make this all-important choice. And maybe the best way to understand this is to think about uh, weddings, and particularly wedding ceremonies. As a pastor, I've had the pleasure of officiating at quite a few weddings. And one of the lines towards the end of a Christian wedding ceremony is this one. And now, before God and these witnesses, I declare that this man and this woman are now husband and wife. And even on marriage licenses in this state, and I believe in every state in the Union, there is a place where the signature of witnesses are required. And that is to mark the solemnity and the seriousness of the promises that are made. It underscores their importance. But Joshua, who probably knows his people only too well, is not done speaking to them yet. He continues in verse 23. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you, and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. Now even though the people have promised to serve God, Joshua knows that some of them have probably in their possessions little gods or, or little idols. After all, at that time, nearly every culture and people in their land had many, many multiple gods that they worshipped. People in those, in those days, they collected gods like, like we collect apps on our phone or, or books in our libraries or, or points or accomplishments in the video game. It was just like everybody and almost everybody had them. It, it just went along with living in that time. But here Joshua is telling them that, that they, if they are going to serve God, they need to get rid of all those false little gods. And you know, that is the way life is. If you're going to say yes to some things, you need to say no to a lot of other things. I still remember one woman, a mom of a couple of youth group kids, when I was doing, back, this was back when I was doing youth ministry in Ellensburg, she said, you know, when I was in college, I was very social, and I had lots of friends, including lots of guy friends. But when I met Paul and decided that I wanted to pursue a relationship with him, I just knew that there were some activities that I could no longer do alone with some of my guy friends. I just knew that was necessary. And truth be told, I think we all know this to be true. That is why when performing Christian wedding ceremonies, just after the phrase I just mentioned a little earlier, and now before God and these witnesses, I declare that this man and this woman are now husband and wife. Then I ask the couple to join their right hands with mine. And I say these words, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Because as Christians, we believe in the sanctity of marriage. We believe that saying yes to a husband or wife means saying no to everyone else. No exceptions. And it is the same with God. Our God is a jealous God. He does not tolerate us cheating on Him with our affections. No way. Now, I also believe in eternal security and kind of once saved, always saved. Now, exactly how this scripture passage uh, fits together with eternal security, well, that may be one of those mysteries of our faith which is only fully resolved in heaven. But I will say this, I do think far too many people in our world, they kind of abuse God's forgiveness. They cheapen God's grace by not even putting forth much effort. And here, Joshua wants to make sure that that strategy, that's not acceptable for the people of God. In verse 24, the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve, and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. The verses end with Joshua and the people marking that day, and also marking that place. And if you read a little further on, they even erect a stone marker to mark that particular place at Shechem. They are promising to serve God, and God is promising to save them. 
covenant is a holy agreement between them and the Lord. Each party promises certain things to the other. Now we in our eco-Presbyterian denomination, the C stands for covenant. And we strongly believe in the concept of covenant. That God has saved us. And so we have promised and covenanted to serve Him. And that really is the essence of faith. It is grounded in our shared history with God. And we make a covenant in the present, and sometimes we reaffirm that covenant, but we always do so as we look towards the future. And we promise to serve the Lord all the days of our lives. And likewise, we know that God will watch over us, each and every one of us, until he calls us to our eternal home. You know, I cannot read this passage from Joshua 24 without recalling one of my favorite memories connected with it. It reminds me of participating in the Promise Keepers Men's Conferences, which took place all across the country a number of years ago. I remember attending one of those Promise Keepers Conferences in Boise at a large stadium venue. And then, quite a few years later, my dad and I attended a Promise Keepers Conference in Oregon, again, at a large outdoor stadium. And one of my favorite things about those conferences was the worship. Not only great preaching, but also a wonderful, powerful singing of as thousands of male voices were belting out hymns and praise songs. And one of the songs that we sang was, was one of the songs that we sang earlier on in the service, the, the family prayer song. And it was so moving and incredibly powerful to have thousands of men standing on their feet, some with um, arms raised in the air, and singing at the top of their lungs, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, it's a reminder to us that the individual choices that each one of us makes it can end up making a huge difference for our families, for our communities, for our nation, and for our world. So let us continue to serve God in this church, which is God's house, but also in each of our homes and in each of our lives. Hallelujah and amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for the scripture, which reminds us that in the same way Joshua gave the people of God a choice, so we are given a choice to serve you and help us to choose to serve you each and every day of our lives. We pray this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We'll now enjoy a musical interlude and moment for reflection. Now I invite you to stand and by your spirit for the renewal of our baptismal promises. 
Again, I will read the plain text and if you would respond with the bold. Trusting in the gracious promises of God, do you renounce sin and the power of evil in your life and in the world? I renounce them. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? I will with God's help. You may be seated. This concludes the renewal of baptismal promises. <laughs>